Hey, okay, welcome back to the whole CPLD development part of the video card project. It's going, it's going. Oh, by the way, I have branding now. Did you notice I have branding? I don't know why I feel compelled to do branding because I have like 130 followers, which uh, God bless each and every one of you. Um, anyway, it exists now. I'm a little more polished. Um, <laughs> I had to split this up because I had so much footage that I, well, frankly, just got boring watching 30 minutes of it. So here's the second half of that. Um, hopefully it's a little more interesting. Um, I still think the previous one is interesting, but I can see how, you know, maybe that's not everybody's cup of tea. But this time we get the stuff burned onto the chip. Uh, we start playing with the stuff on the board um, and finding out what's broken because it's very clued together code. Um, I will be cutting out a lot of me being confused, but trust me, I was confused. Anyway, uh, let's get on to that. Okay, so here is the deal. So actually this probably bears some re-explaining even if you did watch the last episode, you're gonna need to catch up. So we wrote the basic logic, which is, by the way, incorrect in the last video. Now we need to take the inputs and outputs of that logic and use this IDE and the constraint system to automatically assign which pins those should go to on the CPLD itself. Then we're gonna lock those in, burn it to the chip, and start actually playing with the physical device. Thank you, Joe. Now, back to Joe. We're gonna skip over the constraint editor because basically the constraint says, hey, I wanna fix these signals to these pins, and we don't wanna do that yet. I'm going to run fit design, and this will choose what pins will actually get used. And it looks like it's done. So now what I think we use is the fitter report, if I do remember. And if we scroll through here, it says a lot of stuff. But if we keep scrolling, it should tell us yes. So like here, it's saying the BCE signal. It's attaching to the IO40 pin. And the same thing here, that's going to IO36, IO32. So I'm going to want to boil this down, which I will do offline. And then we can bolt these down in the constraint editor and uh, do some soldering. I've taken this and through the magic of Vim, I've cleaned up that list. So I just have signal on one side, pin name on the other. And I should probably save that somewhere. Now that we've got those, we can kind of back up a step and go to the constraint editor and actually apply those constraints kind of post hoc. In here you have a list for this design of all of the input pins, all of the output pins, and then you get this pretty view of the chip um, and it shows you the pin number. But you'll notice these pins, uh, this will be most obvious if I look at the clock, so mostly they're called IO something. You'd hope that maybe that number corresponds to the pin number, but it does not, it's not really. Because you see, for instance, that clock signal got routed to a clock input called Y0. Here is the package layout, and you can see uh, there are all of these numbered I.O. pins, you know, just like on an Arduino or whatnot. They do not line up with the pin numbers at all. So we have to cross-reference this against the list we just had, and then assign those in the constraint editor. So, for example, I'll just start at this top, and then I'll either fast-forward or skip, because this is a little tedious. But let's start at the BCE signal. That needs to go to I.O. 40, IO40 is pin 76. Now we go back to the constraint editor, find there's BCE, right? That was the one we were looking at. And we assign that to, now it's assigned to pin 76. Ta-da! And then you just keep doing that for every freaking signal. So I guess I'll see you in a minute. All things have been assigned. That took me a little bit, but I believe this is all good now. So we've locked those pins down, so now they can't change on us. Because um, we change our design a bit, they it might decide that it likes different pins. And that's the whole point of locking pins, is you're saying, okay, this signal has to go to this pin now, though, so don't change it on me. One thing I did notice um, is that I missed yet another thing. We have video side chip enable A and B, right? For the two different chips on the left side of the dual port SRAM. But 
I wasn't thinking. I created this BCE signal, the bus side chip enable. There should be two of those because we need to select one chip or the other. Basically the issue here is that if I decide to do a 32-bit bus, this is fine. I think right now I will update this um, just for my down the road testing purposes to assume a 16-bit bus right now. So let's go back to the editor. So we've got BCE, I'm gonna swap this to BCEA and BCE B. So now I've got two of those. And then we're also going to include CA, CPU address zero. So that will be our zeroth bit of the CPU address, which will basically select between chip enable A and chip enable B down the road. Let's update our definitions in our interface here. So we need CPU address zero in here. We also need to make this BCEA and BCEB. Finally, let's find out where we were using BCE. Right, we were just tying it so that we never wrote to the chip. So we'll need to update that when we want to be able to write values into here, but I have everything changed in here. Let me make sure it gets updated in the wrapper code. And that's BCEA, BCEB, the zeroth address line, CA0, BCEA, and BCEB. Okay, I think that's everything. Let's try building it one more time. Okay, let's start by building the code. That looks okay. Go up to the chip level. Prefit. That seems okay. Fit. That seems like it's going all right. Let's check the fitter report. Well, shoot, there's a thing I forgot since the last time I did this. <laughs> I never scrolled to the bottom of the fitter report. Could have saved myself a bit of time. It has a mapping of signal to actual pin right here at the very bottom of the fitter report. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I wasted some time earlier. It's actually interesting because if I re, I, if I close and reopen this file, it may complain that there are actually connections because the name of, yeah, because this doesn't exist anymore. So let's see what it says when I close and reopen the constraint editor. Yeah, see right here. Invalid. Invalid. BCE. Is at 38 now. Yeah, so we have now CA0 unconstrained. BCEA, BCEB unconstrained. So BCEA goes to 38. Now we've locked that. BCEB is the one that goes to 30. So let's lock that at 30. And CA0 got assigned to CA0. Uh, that was 60. Okay. So now, at least for this revision of the pin layout and the, the I.O. interface, we have everything locked down. Okay, let's jam this in here. And hopefully none of my connections broke because this crappy solder job, uh, they break all the time. All right, and then we jam that into this ridiculous programmer. But I don't know what pin eight is. I believe it's the brown wire. Hopefully we don't blow anything up. Slap the chip in there. And then we also need power. Hopefully it sees the programmer being attached. That's a first step. And all I have to do is edit device and change the uh, JED file that I'm programming. Let's see if this does anything. Nope. Well, that is a bummer. Looks like uh, that may have just been a bad chip because I just swapped the chip and hit go and this one is running okay. Usually takes about 13 seconds and it should go, gotcha bud. And yep, there we go, pass. But cool, pass. So let's shove this into the old, the old new video card. I'll get the clock in. I will get the uh, H-Sync and V-Sync and the multiplex lines. 
And then I'll just use the multiplex lines to drive this. And I forgot I had this, but this is going to be pretty useful. Um, this is a VGA interface for the Raspberry Pi, which I was going to use for an arcade project. But this already has the uh, DAC resistors in it and everything, so I should just be able to like run some, some flyover wires to this and make a nice little test harness. Hopefully... I should see something if my V-Sync is right and my uh, multiplex signals are right. We should get a nice little square of uh, nonsense garbage. Well, it, it'll be a regular pattern, actually. So we should get a nice stripey regular pattern in the middle of the image and then black borders all around. I almost guarantee you that this will not work the first try, but um, let's solder those in and we will, you know, <laughs> see where we're at. Okay, so I just made a quick note so that this will hopefully go fairly fast. Just noted down the H-Sync, the V-Sync, um, and those multiplex addresses, and that should be hopefully all we need, just to do something for video and something for sync. Hold up. Give me a hot minute. Give me just a, a goddamn minute. All right, so here is my poor cannibalized old video card. Um, <laughs> took the chip out to uh, try and do that programming. And I think I also need to cannibalize this uh, clock chip, because I can't seem to find another one. Uh, it's a 25 megahertz and some. Uh, this is actually, I bought the actual proper timing for VGA. You can get away with like 25 or, um, in that Ben Eater video, he uses 10 megahertz apparently uh, to divide down and do, uh, you know, two pixel wide pixels basically. Um, but I decided to go with the exact thing and I don't have anything even reasonably close to this. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just cannibalize this one. Oh, that is probably one other thing I should make a note of, huh? Is what the uh, clock input is. Clock 25 megahertz is at 20. I'm trying to figure out this one. Um, I didn't think this one ahead too much. I am out of chip sockets. You know, I only have one of these, so I don't really want to solder it directly in. I think my, my hack is gonna be, I'm just going to use regular headers and just solder it on and then stick it into a, into a header plug. Watch me hack. Oh man, that is just, that is just distasteful. That is nasty and not like in a cool way. All right, so let's put it near. Clock is at pin 20, pin 20 is here because th they're the same footprint, both these chips. So I am just gonna use this to, to reference again. 20 is on the top side. <laughs> okay, that might be the funniest thing I've ever seen. Okay, now I'm gonna keep up the lame thing where I have just been putting in headers because what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to, for now, I'm not actually going to connect the multiplex outputs to the multiplex control inputs here. Um, what I am going to do, of course, is just fly them over, fly them over to the correct signals on this guy um, so that hopefully we'll get some kind of video thing.
Okay, so now is that part where I'm remembering that this is where it starts getting pretty difficult because since pins are kind of randomly placed around the package based on what the fitter was able to optimize, um, <laughs> it's harder to just count. And uh, it does get easier when you're doing these PLCCs as the holes start to fill up. And especially again with me, it's mostly an issue of not trusting myself as I do this to uh, you know count properly. One of those basic educational issues I have. Give me a hot minute while I figure out what the heck the pinout is on this guy. Okay, good question. Where's the chip that I just programmed? Oh, it's, it's still in the programmer. Okay, thought I lost it, thought I confused them. But if it's still in the programmer, then that means that's the one I programmed, right? Oh boy, fingers crossed. Hopefully this is right. I finally uh, I decided to put a ground connection over here because uh, God knows things need ground. And of course this connector needs ground. These should be horizontal sync and vertical sync over here. And then these are the four multiplexer select lines. I have them wired up to looking at the schematic on this thing. Uh, this is kind of a semi-bright red. This is a semi-bright green. Uh, they're not the full top bits because this expects the 3.3 volts from a Raspberry Pi. So, you know, I'm running at 5 volts here, so I don't want to kill things. Then this one is a darkish blue. It's one of the lower order blue bits. And then finally, this guy is the same order blue bit as the red and green. So we should get lightish blue, then a stripe of darkish blue, then a stripe of lightish green, then a stripe of lightish red. Hopefully. I don't know, let's, let's plug it in and blow ourselves up. Okay, monitor is plugged in. There's a lot of things that have to fit together for this to actually go right. My clock signal needs to be going in correctly. Um, these need to be wired up correctly. All my timings in the chip need to be right, and all of that is questionable. Okay, power is finally going on. And absolutely nothing is happening. Uh, this is my eBay special Hewlett Packard 1663C logic analyzer that I got for, I don't know, like a hundred bucks. It was, it was not a bad deal. Mainly watching too much uh, Curious Mark made me realize I really needed one of these in my life. And it was actually super, super useful in debugging the other computer because uh, mainly I could, I could kind of do bus cycle traces with it. Um, which was super useful because I could make sure that like my code was executing the way I expected it to and that, you know, everything was happening correctly on the bus. Super useful. Uh, what I'm going to start out doing here is just uh, begin by making sure that I'm actually getting clock on the pin that I think I should be getting clock and that, you know, nothing bad is happening over here. I think that'll be fine, but that's my sanity check. So give me a hot second to set that up over here um, if I can remember how and then uh, we'll try and get a trace out of that. That should just be a nice uh, square clock looking thing. Okay, I think that's all I need to do. I set up a label on the clock guy. <laughs> Let me give power to this guy. And uh, let's run it, I guess. Okay, so that's not great. As you may have noticed, for the uh, ground pad, I had put in a little bit of uh, solder wick just to help the clips grip better. This is not even close to the best way to do this. Um, I think I might do that to this one real quick just to make sure things are gripping properly. Okay, I'm gonna hit power. And hey, why not? Let's just hit run. Whoa, okay, yeah, that looks like a clock signal. Wow, okay. So that's literally all it was. <laughs> so this is of course a note to self. Always just, just check your power first. Okay, hopefully the way this is set up now is it should have, it still has that clock um, and then it has, you know, a separate channel for H-Sync, V-Sync, all of each of the uh, video multiplex bits and I have this now, previously it was what was called uh, timing mode, where it just tries to sample as fast as it can and displays you what it sampled. In this case, uh, the clock line, each, each one of these pods has a clock line and uh, it will use that as the sampling control uh, for sampling other inputs. So it's not constantly sampling, it just samples on 
some edge of this. And now I'm going to, to turn power on and hit run and hopefully um, we should see, I don't know how many samples this thing can hold at a time. Um, so I guess we will just have to see, sorry, I'm getting distracted by this. So I guess we will just have to see what we get, but hopefully we should see some stuff flipping around the way we kind of expect. And let's switch to waveform. This is looking promising, but let's switch to waveform. Oh, great. Sorry, give me a second. I have to add all these freaking labels to this screen. How the frick do I add an input? I have done this before. Okay, so we're gonna zoom way in. So one thing I'm noticing right away is that we're not seeing anything on the multiplex bits, which is probably because shit's not working right. Probably because I wrote things wrong. However, like H-Sync looks like it's doing something. Yeah, so H-Sync is happening pretty regular. <laughs> okay, so we caught three lines, but we are in fact not seeing these guys do anything, which is unfortunate. Now with H-Sync doing a regular pulse, I feel pretty confident that V-Sync is doing stuff. V-Sync is low here, so I am assuming, you know, that it would only make sense that that means that this is an active video area. But now that we know that this is actually doing stuff, just for shits and giggles, I'm gonna plug it back into the monitor and see if we get anything, because maybe I'm just not seeing enough of the story here. Hey, okay, that's something. Um, it's saying it can't display this video mode, but it is, in fact, detecting that there is uh, sync signals on here. That's something. Okay, so I'm playing around and I decided to set up some triggers on V-Sync and it made me realize that I'm seeing a lot of this. It's catching a bunch of spurious spikes on H-Sync and V-Sync. Um, that could just be that, you know. Note to editor, ignore that last one. I did not have uh, the ground attached to the, to the logic analyzer. So that's, whoops. After sitting here and scratching my head for a bit, I have realized that this might actually be something very stupid, which is almost invariably the case. I still don't know why these aren't firing right. That's the uh, video mux outputs. The more I look at that, the more I don't like it. And it's probably fairly obvious. And you probably noticed when I was writing it that it's wrong, but I am in the heat of the moment here. So I'm not focusing correctly. Anyway, H-Sync and V-Sync, and I thought this might be the case, and I don't know why I also didn't go immediately to it. I basically just forgot once I got deep into it. Um, they're supposed to be negative. I'm going to try that, I guess. Just a real quick thing. And maybe that's why the uh, monitor is saying I have no idea what mode this is. All right, so uh, as we were, I need to yank that out. That's what she said. Oh, I found my yanking tool. That is also what she said. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not gonna work there, boss. That might be a problem. Chip has been reprogrammed, programmer fixed, burned successfully. Okay, it's a million little things. But now the test rig is set back up again, we're plugged back in. So uh, let's give it some power. Green light, which is good. And so far nothing on the screen, which is kind of to be expected, right? Because even if this was working as well as we could expect it from our last changes, um, we weren't seeing any anything happening on the scope back there. So we would we would be getting blackness. But hopefully, yeah, it shows 640 by 480 at 60 hertz um, right there. So I think we're making good sync signals. Now that means nothing, nothing in terms of our actual video output. Um, but I think, I think we need to make some code changes because I was even looking out of the side of my eye at that code. Um, for the video multiplexing guys, and it did not sit right with me. So um, let's go back to the drawing board on that one. Okay, let's see if we can track this effort down. Now let's look at that actual weird ass code I wrote. Okay, so one thing that I already know uh, is nonsensical is this, because it shouldn't be zero, one, two, three, it should be one, two, four and eight, right? Um, yeah, that seems fairly obvious. Give that a save, but that still shouldn't, that still doesn't explain it because this should have output something, right? Well, let me try writing this kind of backwards. I'm gonna say VM zero, 
is only on when not VA0 and not VA1 and not blank, right? That would be my assumption. It's an easier way to write it. Um, it's a little more clear. I think that's what I was saying with my last code, but um, rewriting can always shake off the cobwebs and, you know, it's a completely different way of writing it. So if something's just totally wrong with this, then this will highlight that maybe there's deeper things that this is depending on that don't work, but we're just gonna try it a different way. Okay, okay, let's try this. Let's just try that. Let's just try that. Burned again, hooked up again. We're gonna hit power again. We'll see what happens. Video signal. Nothing. I think the first thing I'm going to try is I'm just going to set the zeroth, uh, this guy, to the blanking signal, and then I'm gonna look at it over on the logic analyzer to see what this internal blank signal actually looks like. Because it's possible that this is actually screwed up or produces some logical situation where uh, because of something that's not super obvious to me just looking at it right here, uh, this is always true. So now we have exposed that signal on VM0, and if we probe that, we should see what is actually going on with that blank signal. Let's give that a look. Okay, so this is the dot clock, um, and this is HSync, which of course is now going low, which we want. Uh, but if you notice, um, VM0, see how all these are down here? VM0 is up here, which means that busy is always high. And I have scrolled through this. You can scroll through this whole capture, and it's only one capture. I'll try and do some, some more, but that never changes. So I am going to uh, try and set a trigger for that going low now, just in case, you know, maybe we're in some non-visible area of the display and run and look at that it's just sitting here waiting for that event to happen because it will never happen so each video area is just some lower bound some upper bound or together and then it's inverted each blank is some lower bound some upper bound or together not inverted that's the only difference so these should be very close, right? They should look very similar, but they don't look similar at all on the scope. So here's my thought. Here's my hack thought. Since these are kind of redundant already, I'm going to try a test where I get rid of these because well, I don't care about these. The only reason I have H blank and V blank is they tell me when I don't have video, but I already don't have video. I mean, you know, you know from earlier, that's the only reason I left these in was just to have reference. So I'm just going to remove the references to them, let them hang out, get optimized out. And then, uh, so in blank, I'm removing them entirely. And I'm going to reset these to what I wanted them to be because the H video area and V video area signals look fine. It's only the blank signals that don't look fine. Anyway, yeah, so that I'm sure was my issue. Oh my god, it should have been staring me in the face that whole time and my brain was just too soupy to realize it. Um, we'll see what happens here. There is one thing, uh, VM0 was not tied to the right pin, firstly. I double checked that and uh, that was in fact wrong. It was tied to 34 when it, or uh, 84 when it should have been tied to 83. So that's probably why this is high all the time. So that I don't know how much that screwed us up, but I don't think very much. I think the main thing is I'm looking at it and, and okay, so previously we had uh, H blank or V blank was blank, right? And H blank and V blank were positive for being in the blanking area. The issue is those H video area ones and the V video area I'm inverting. And then I was oaring those, I was oaring the reinversion of those together, except that, um, that's not how that works, logically. That's not how the, the logic math, the Boolean algebra of that works out. It should be blanking if it's not in the uh, vertical video area and not in the horizontal video area, not or, not or. It should only blank when it's, well, no, fuck. That doesn't make sense, right? God, I should probably cut this. 
Hey, you want to see something cool? Ha ha! Ha ha! I did it. <laughs> I'm still not sure. Um, I'll just describe because I eventually just decided to stop shooting because I was I was getting nowhere. I just removed the whole H blank thing. I renamed blanking the the larger blanking area. Um, I I just renamed those to H blank and V blank. <laughs> But I kept the numbers the same, and I removed the inversion. Um, and then the other big change I made was in the uh, video address section. So I, I don't think I have footage of it, but I routed the low four bits of the video address over to the header pins that are for the multiplexer outputs, and get looked to be counting correctly. Um, I removed all of the complex, if I'm in blanking mode or not blanking mode, uh, code for the address counting. So it's, it's wrong. Don't let this fool you. It is actually wrong, um, the actual address count. But the low order four bits are fine. Um, basically, it's always counting, whether it's in a blank area or not, uh, which I should be able to swap back in now. But so that has been simplified. And so these are... You know, each going on one at a time. You can't tell the really dark one. It is actually, it's it's a dark blue in person. Um, so it's, it's doing what I wanted it to. So we're fairly close, but I am calling it. I have no idea how long this video is going to be. Um, yeah, let's go back to my face as is tradition. So um, that's, I, I mean, it's a lot of progress, right? Because now we have like a video signal. We did not have a video signal before. That's super great. Um, so I guess I'm going to call it here because to me the next step is actually hooking that up to the VRAM and routing everything through the VRAM first. So we should go from this to some random static and then finally we should go to a place where we can shove some uh, pixels into the memory on the other side of the dual port. But uh, yeah, that's all I can take. This has literally been a couple weeks of shooting and I am sick of it. I mean, I like this project, but um, I need to put something out. I really do. So that's where I'm calling it. Thank you so much for coming by. Uh, I hope you enjoyed watching me struggle. It was fun to struggle, especially now that I have some results. That's the main thing that feels good. So thanks for coming to see me, and I will see you guys next time.